Good afternoon, everybody. It is Monday, May 3rd, 2021, and it is time for Stocks of the Week. I have some pretty interesting ideas this week. I'd just like to review some of the thoughts on how we pick things out and why we pick them out. So Stocks of the Week, both at Fundamental Trends, same article over at Margin of Safety Investing. You can read it in either place if you're a member. And we want to buy stocks that are great or that we think can be great. And the reason being is that we know, this is statistical, just stuff we know, about 10% of the stocks account for 100% of the total upside performance in the stock market. The other 90% cancel each other out. So the top 10% of the stocks basically make all the money. So our job is to find the top 10% of the stocks. We can invest in ETFs and then focus those that are proper industries and sectors, avoiding single stock risk and still beat the market by a few points. To add that big upside to your portfolio, to try to get those 15% plus total gains year over year on average, you know, some of your years will have huge years, other years you won't do so well. But if you want to make 15 to 25%, which makes you a two percenter for sure, um, then you want to have a basket of individual securities that can beat the market by a lot, an average over 15%. So if your ETF portfolio is somewhere in that 10 to 15% range, to pull yourself up to total returns of 15% plus, you're going to need quite a few stocks that average over 20, in fact, if you're doing it the way I do, which is about half ETFs and half stocks. So how do we pick out stocks that can be great and get those 20 and 30 and 40% annualized returns? You ignore everything in the middle. I've showed you the barbell over and over again. You're going to end up with stocks in the middle, but you shouldn't be looking to add them. You should always look to add those stocks that can have big gains, even your dividend stocks, you know, we invest in AT&T, not because of the 7% yield, which is wonderful, uh, but we're looking for that one to double or triple as the company evolves from an old paradigm to a new paradigm. So focus on great and look for two types of companies, companies that are already great and companies that could potentially be great. Obviously, the great companies are a little easier to figure out. Your Apple, Microsoft, Google, they just churn out cash by the bucket load, right? You can usually buy these on a mass correction in the market. That's about the only time with a great company. Why? Because markets are fairly efficient on the large caps. People in their head can't seem to recognize that small and mid cap stocks are where you make the most money. They think that there's a lot of stability in the large caps. The reality is that those are what leads the market down on the way down. However, they also lead the market back up on the way up. So for beating the market with individual great stocks, you buy those on the corrections and then you ride them and trim them when you think the market is topping. Your potentially great companies are hard to identify because greatness is hard to identify early. And because we tend to speculate too much and take way too much risk to overpay for potential greatness. So at the end of the presentation today, I'm gonna to take a look at two stocks that are potentially great, but I don't like the prices right now. So I'm going to watch them and see if there's a point a month somewhere or two months or three months somewhere that I can get these potentially great stocks at a price that isn't so risky basically getting the froth out of the stock and buying them near a bottom. And one of our examples of today will show you what that should look like. So let's take a look at some companies. Azure Global Power. This is a stock that I put on our list, on the very short list, about what, three or four months ago, back when I revised the utility section of the VSL. And this is an Indian solar provider that really spiked up big when everybody was just throwing money around, where everything sustainable caught a bid. And now it's come back down. 
So you take a look at this, Just pull it over. That's the IPO back there. And we ask ourselves a question. At what point is low enough, low enough? I think we're just about there. We just went by the 0.618 retrace, and we could hit, head down to the 786, but it looks like we are at the bottom of the buy zone. We are somewhere near the bottom of the stock. Got all the way up to about 50. And here we are now back down at 22 after a loss today. Why do I really like this stock? Well, first off, they are the only Indian solar provider on the New York Stock Exchange. So they are complying with all the rules of the New York Stock Exchange. That's a big deal. Remember, I don't like commie stocks because most of them don't comply. This company makes a point of complying with everything. So it's actually listed on the New York Stock Exchange the way that any American company would be listed. They have a compound uh, annual growth rate of about 24% projected out through the end of the decade. I actually think they're going to beat it. Why do I think they're going to beat it? Because India needs jobs and they're trying to get rid of coal. They just put out a report that the price of solar in India, much like just happened in the United States, is now cheaper than coal when you factor in cleaning up the mess that coal makes. Doesn't include the health problems from coal, which probably makes coal way more expensive than we get a credit, give it credit for. So this company's growing at 24% per year. When you take a look at the investor presentation, what you realize is that this company is probably going to exceed expectations that people are selling it off because of all the problems in India right now. This is one of those times when you can say, you know, there's probably factors here at play that are pushing the stock down way further than it should be. So somewhere between today's price and middle teens, I am going to open a starter position in the stock this week. I can't sell cash secured puts because there isn't any right now. Eventually there will be an options market. But I don't see this stock going much below the support level. So anywhere between 17 and about where we are now, 23-ish. So 17 to 23 when we're already there. It's rare that it doesn't hold the 618 line. So there's a very good chance it just pops right back up tomorrow. Gives you international diversification in a young economy that's highly educated, highly skilled. And because we have to consider things like these, like this, the reality is that a lot of older people in India are dying. So that economy is getting even younger. And a lot of people who probably weren't the best for the economy are dying. And it's horrible, but it's a fact. So the growth in India and the rebound in India, I think in about a year is going to be spectacular. So I want exposure to India. Looking at the ETFs, I'm looking at several stocks. This is the one that I'm gonna start with. And I think that probably if you scale into this once about here, it drops down to 16, 17, you buy again. Quidel, we talked about two weeks ago in the retirement income options uh, presentation. They are getting hammered because of the reopen and the supposed end of COVID. It won't be the end of COVID, by the way. We're going to be testing for COVID forever. And these guys are going to be one of the handful of leaders. And Wisconsin Exact Sciences is a leader, uh, but that's a hometown contract, right? Uh, Quidel is all over the place. And they are trading at an unusually cheap price to cash flow. They are actually trading at a price where they could get taken over. So given that they're still growing because they have just great point of care testing, they're a leader there. I wouldn't be surprised to see either an M&A deal or they merge with somebody. I actually think they would make sense to merge with Exact. Uh, however, I don't know that I could see that just because of the, the people involved. However, maybe, we'll see. Uh, but I could also see Quidel just getting bought out. If it gets any cheaper, it gets down to about six times cash flow. That's where private equity companies start to go hunting. So this is basically at takeover price right now. Stock is oversold on the weekly and the daily. 
it is getting all the way down to the 786 line, which again is unusual, but it happens. Uh, given where the cash flow numbers are to price, this one's probably a buy right now. So I'm going to open a position in this this week uh, for accounts uh, that can take the option trades. I'll probably sell some puts as well. I don't really see this one getting much lower. You know, every time I say that, something goes lower. Could it get all the way down to the 60s? I guess. But it doesn't make a lot of sense given that they're already approaching the prices that they had coming into last year, right? This was a $50, $60 stock before the pandemic. They're not going to lose all the testing business that they picked up because we are going to keep testing. The diagnostics are becoming more and more important. I expect an m and deal here, to be quite honest with you. I think they might just get bought out. So I don't think there's much downside here. I do think there's just a lot of growth potential out here. And it might take five years to get back to $300 a share. That's still pretty good. That's still a triple. But I think this is one that, you know, if it gets bought out, we might make 50% of our money, break our hearts. But it could be a triple if they stay, you know, stay in their current form over the next five years. Their growth rates are good. Uh, their balance sheet is good. Uh, there's really just not much to dislike about this company at this at this price. So I started talking about it as it came down in here and it's at the bottom of our buy zone. On track, I like better. On track, I think is my favorite stock in the healthcare space right now. Uh, they are a leader in mental health care that is delivered with telehealth and uses AI to track people and help them monitor their other health conditions. As we've talked about before, people with mental health issues often don't treat, treat their other health conditions. And that's where these guys excel. Part two or step two of our four step process for finding a stock that we wanna be invested in is to analyze the government or central bank policy that might impact it. It's quite clear that this company is a favorite of the government. They've gotten both Medicare and VA deals recently. So although Aetna decided to go another direction, A, we don't know that they're not coming back and just negotiating, uh, but B, all that business has already been replaced. It's already got new contracts in place. So next year, this company is going to be back to 30, 40% growth, even though this year is gonna look flat. And that's if Aetna doesn't come back by July which I still think they might. The growth potential for this company is literally massive. You are talking uh, an addressable space in the United States uh, that is about 16 times this company's market cap, and they're one of the only players. If they end up being the dominant force, you know, this could be a 10-bagger stock from these prices. Now, when it's screamed way up here on the everything goes up because of the pandemic, you know, probably wasn't going to triple or be a multi-bagger, you know, be a 10-bagger from 100. But from 30-something, I think a triple is pretty easy. Could it get to 300? Nah, maybe. Maybe. I mean, if it could be a triple from 100, it could be a 10-bagger from 30. You have to see how much love it gets and how much of the market it captures, how fast that happens. I suspect that if these stimulus bills go through, these guys are going to get expanded contracts with Medicare and the VA. And I think we'll probably see Blue Cross Blue Shield come on board in a big way, especially out east. Why do I say that? Because I follow these markets. Teladoc. Here's one of the stocks that I'm not super excited about at this price, but it's getting close. So while I like on track better, following this company can help you follow on track. So Tele Teladoc. Uh, is still growing real fast. Uh, their EBITDA grew $56 million. They just raised full year guidance for 2021. And here's where being able to follow the contracts, which I was doing in here, taking a look at their earnings. So they significantly expanded their relationship with the Blue Cross Blue Shield companies out east. And I expect that that's going to happen with OnTrack as well. So when we take a look at this one and say, okay, where do I want to buy this stock? You can see that it hasn't quite leveled off here yet. It doesn't have that sideways motion yet that we see in OnTrack. So 
do this line. Make this real thin. Make another one. What stock did we just have the same formation on and then it shot up? Does anybody remember? It's about a month or two ago. Two initials. Come on, gang. There you go. That's right. MP had the same formation. Consolidation triangle here. Then it bounced and it jumped out. It's since came back. But when you have these consolidations here, it's usually a good sign that you're going to get a rally. Now, it might only rally up to 45, 50 initially, come back, consolidate, then take another leg up. So when you think about things like Elliott Wave, that was that would be where you could use this. A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four, five. Teladoc, on the other hand, I'm not so sure that's happening yet. I think we're probably going to see it down here. And there's a chance that it comes all the way down to the 786 line. That would be awfully, awfully oversold. It's already oversold. So we'll see how much further down it can go. I would have a hard time not buying it around 140. And if it did get down to 100, I'd back up the truck. But this is a potentially great company, huge margin, 68%. And that'll draw on some competition. So you worry about commoditization. But the thing with telehealth is you have to have some scale. So I don't expect a lot of competitors to come in. And then once they do, I expect a lot of M&A. And I don't really see the major health plans running their own telehealth system because then they have to hire all those people. It's cheaper for them to contract out. And then finally, Zoom, which we haven't talked about much. But when you talk about an online meeting now, we're starting to say, I'm going to do a Zoom call, I'm going to do a Zoom meeting. We're using Zoom right now. And this is a, a product that I used for the company ever IPO'd, just like I used Ring Central before that company ever IPO'd. You know what the lesson is? If you're using a company's pro, uh, product and they're private and then they IPO, buy some of the stock because they're doing something right. If you're already using the, the product while they're still private and they IPO, buy a little stock, see what happens. I think that's probably a good lesson. I don't know if it's 100%, but I really wish I had bought both of those stocks on their IPO. They're both products that I've used. Now, I don't use Ring Central anymore. Why? Well, I just don't like phone calls. I, I don't take incoming calls without an appointment. So I didn't really need my 800 line. When I was going to build a big thing uh, of an investment advisory. I was going to do that. I decided not to because building a big thing means that you work 70, 80 hours a week and you don't get a lot of vacations. I prefer to work 50 something hours a week and get vacations. So, you know, I did the publishing instead. And I think we're getting to a point with the technology, companies like Zoom, that building an investment advisory is online is becoming more acceptable. So I'm going in that direction. And Zoom is a big part of that. I do meetings on Zoom now with, you know, 55 clients, give or take. And I believe that these guys are going to go through another growth cycle because of their international penetration. But also, they have a phone line now, direct uh, phone service connected directly to Zoom. So you can use Zoom, much like you can use Facebook now to make calls, you can use Zoom to do it. So companies that have a standalone phone service, they're going to have to get bought. So I think Ring Central gets bought. And I think one of the companies that competes with Zoom for the meetings will get bought by Ring Central. If that hasn't happened already, I haven't even checked. But I can see Microsoft buying Ring Central. That makes a lot of sense. Fold it in with LinkedIn and Office. In any case, Zoom is starting to have more products on their platform and it's making them stickier. You know, for all the complaints you have about Facebook, you still have it. Zoom is gonna be a lot more productive. And they, I will say, I'm impressed that every time market says, hey, you don't have this, they add it. And they, and, and they, and they have upgraded over and over again. So even though we had some hiccups with this last year, because so many people jumped on, you take a look and you say, hmm, so here's the problem with Zoom. Even though the revenue is growing quickly, if they have an annualized growth rate 
of 15% over the next seven or eight years, their revenue will go from about a billion to about 3 billion. Their growth rates are probably gonna be closer to 50%. So they're probably going to be at 3 billion in revenue in 2024. Their free cash flow is already humming at 400 million in the, in the next uh, year. So where does that leave earnings per share? Forward looking for a year, you're looking at about $4 of earnings in 2022. At the current price, the forward PE is about 75. That's still pretty pricey. Even with a growth rate of 50% for the next several years, which I expect before it tails down as the market becomes saturated, because everybody's going to adopt some sort of technology like this. So if this company gets to four or five or six billion in revenue by sometime mid-decade, which is what I expect, how do you normalize for earnings? Well, a PE of 75 doesn't make sense if the future growth five years out is only gonna be 10, 15%. So we'll have some hyper growth for a while. So where do the lines cross? Not quite positive, but usually that number, PE needs to get below the growth rate, below the expected growth rate. So if you average out a bunch of 50s over the next five years, coming back down into the 15, 10, 15% range, six, seven, eight years out, you say, okay, their average growth rate for a decade is going to be 30 something percent. And we have to look for a forward PE of somewhere in the 30s or 40s, probably, to make this buy. How does that happen? Right now, the share price is around 300. And I've already identified the 786 line, which seems to be something that stocks are aiming for now. I don't think that this is quite what I'm looking for. I know people love the stock. This isn't quite coming together like the other ones. It's close. This set a new low right here. I don't know if you can see that really well. It should have set a new low if it was consolidating. So it broke the higher low rule, which makes me think it's going to head into this box. And if it does, now it becomes a lot more interesting. Well, I'm not quite ready to buy this because it didn't stay within the triangle. It broke below it right here. So this gets down to 200. Now all of a sudden you have a PE of forward PE of around 50-ish. You start to go, hmm, now I'm just trying to see where the momentum breaks. So that's what I'm looking for with Zoom. If you get this in the lower 200s, I think you probably are going to want it. Maybe it breaks even below 200. We'll see. But they've added a lot of revenue and a lot of free cash flow. And it's going to be pretty good. And this company is going to probably start kicking off a dividend at some point. And it's just a lot of cash flow, right? It's a very scalable business. They don't have to add much in input to increase their revenue. So we can just start doing mathematical cal calculations and say, this, this looks like a smaller version of Facebook, right? Without the advertising. Who's to say they don't get into that? So I like Zoom. I think there's other applications for the technology that coincide with media. And there's other things that could drive this higher. And frankly, if it does get down to around $200 a share, you're going to start to see an awful lot of people take interest in it uh, from the standpoint of taking it over. But again, we see that there's huge buying interest here. So as we get closer to this level, buying interest comes back. And people generally get in a little bit above where the previous buying levels were. Why? Because people don't want to miss it. So if it gets down to here, you should be pretty interested. So this is another one of those stories where you say, I love the company. I think it can be great. I think it's going to start throwing off income. I think it's going to have another big rally someday. But from what point do we want it? Look at these stair levels down. Where's the bottom stair? It might be here, but it's still awfully risky to me. Down here, right, in this range, look where this support was, or resistance. And maybe it's 250, 260, but lower than 321, which is what I believe it got to today. 313 is what it closed at. But again, if this had held that, and it didn't, but it held, then I, maybe we just say, yeah, look, it's consolidating, it's going to break back out. I don't think the market's quite ready for it to stop going down yet. Plus, that 75 PE, right, that forward PE of 75 makes me go, hmm, still some risk in there. 
All right, any questions about any of these stocks or anything else that we've talked about recently? Anything on the BSL? Quite a few stocks that are overbought on the weekly or close to overbought. So we basically covered a bunch of those, right? Zoom is almost, excuse me, oversold. QuantumScape, so Ford just invested in a different solid state battery. I think QuantumScape doesn't make any money at all, right? They're burning money, they're hemorrhaging money and they're not ready to go to market. QuantumScape is hugely speculative at this point, hugely. Again, I don't want to bet against the scientists. Like I said, if there's a finish line, let's look at the daily chart. They should, they'll find it. Still clearly in a downtrend, right? Were we talking about this at like $60, $70 a share recently, right? It's still coming down. Volume is falling off though. MFI is pretty low on the daily, so let's take a look at the weekly. Yeah, I like the backers, right? And I like the, the technology idea. I understand that the market is huge. It's definitely had lower on the weekly chart, right? RSI isn't oversold on the weekly. That's turning, the trend is turning over, and there's nothing positive about these trends. So this would be the definition of trying to catch a falling knife. Now, if you can catch a falling knife one inch from the floor, that's wonderful. You know, you're going to hit a home run. But, you know, you can always pick it up off the floor, too, because it'll usually get that sideways chop at some point, right? You haven't quite seen it yet. So I would wait on this one. It wouldn't surprise me to see this one get back down under 20. For sure in the 20s. I mean, it's almost there. Some big buyers are buying it right under 20. So in here, well, it's getting close, right? Are there any good puts on this one? I think that's a good question. So your June puts, buck 38 for the 25, and we're just looking at it in the lower 20s. I mean, if I could get five bucks for this at a net price of 20, presuming the momentum on the downside was starting to abate, I think that'd be pretty interesting. So I think we're getting close with QuantumScape to take a speculative position. But again, you manage your speculations with price and with position sizing. Let the knife, you know, head down. You know, this is an interesting put because you see there's quite a bit of open interest here. My guess is that at least somebody bought these puts and sold these puts. That'd be my guess. So again, I think that somebody, or several somebodies, are seeing what I see with this chart and seeing that, Right in here, low to middle 20s, probably where it's heading. So we're, we're close on this one, I guess is what I'm saying. And again, this is a highly speculative company. I don't want to bet against the scientists though. So if you're going to bet on scientists, bet on something that it could be a potentially gigantic market. Anyone else? No, nope. all right. Then we will call it a day. All right, uh, take a look at the article. I think it was, uh, I don't know, I did a lot of work on it, reading a lot of the things that I found on Sentio. Um, been reading all day, actually. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna write separate pieces about all those companies. I just gotta whip them together, which, you know, takes time. Uh, on track, if you're not buying on track right now, you're just, you're not paying attention. You need to buy on track. You, if you if you sell puts, you should also sell puts for your second tranche. So if you buy a little on track now and sell puts a few bucks below, collect that premium, you get two tranches about four or five bucks apart. Now that's a pretty interesting scaling in process, right? We looked at that chart. So if you sell puts, I would take a starter position in on track because I'm thinking it might be ready to break out. I showed you the triangle pattern and doesn't hurt to have the premium and it doesn't hurt to have a little bit more if you get it at a lower price. All right. Take care, everybody. And I will get this uh, up sometime tonight.